had that opportunity to go grow up and, and have a college experience? You know, um, I, I, I agree with Jason. I think most guys should go to college. I, I, I can't sit here and say that it's, it's for everybody. I think I, I love that baseball has that opportunity because some guys are ready to go and the organization is going to make an investment, a big enough investment in those guys to give them time. It's just that's the world's changed so much. And when I was going through, uh, when you were drafted and you, you actually signed, it seemed that, that you would get several years to, to work it out. And, and it's not like that anymore. If you don't perform, um, it's going to be a short career. So, um, all the more reason that Jason's right for most guys, because even, even with a good investment, uh, you know, I've had several guys, as you said, get drafted and, and go out and play. And I mean, one of the, one of the highest picks, um, we've had, he he didn't, he lasted three years and, and that was it. And, um, he didn't get much, it didn't seem like he got much of an opportunity. I mean, I wasn't there, so it's easy for me to say, and I have, an emotional attachment to, to my player. And I, I just, I thought he, he should have gotten a lot more opportunity, especially if you're going to get used that high of a pick on him and, and it didn't, it didn't go that way. And, and, and I've heard that quite a bit uh, with guys and more and more recently, uh, more and more often um, in recent years. So yeah, for guys that, that uh, m- for most guys, college is great because you get to go out and you make, you make your mistakes and, and you learn and you mature and you learn how I, I think college baseball is awesome because you learn how to live on the road a little bit. It's not the same as a pro uh, deal. It's not every day. It's, you know, you're not playing every day, but it's it's a really good bridge to that. If, if you're talented enough to make it, you have to learn how to manage your time and most colleges like us, you know, we have a strength and conditioning guy, so you can change your body while playing and, and, and actually get coaching. You know, that's one of the other things that, that I've heard a lot of guys talk about now is you're expected to go out and perform in pro ball, but there's really not a ton of coaching. You're just playing. So it's really hard to go and compete and perform and make a swing change or make mechanical changes. And in college, there's a little bit of time for some of that stuff and guys can perfect their craft and, you know, truth be told, if 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 you were destined for the big leagues, th- that window can't close in college because you're that type of player. You know, I think that's perfect too with the development. You know, I mean, you've been there. Um, yeah, I would. I mean, I had the opportunity draft out of junior college, and to me, I do wish I went, but the experience I had, you know, my next year at City and then at Oral Roberts, it's just it's hard to take that away cuz who like you said if you're you if it's destined to happen or if it's meant to be it's going to happen right you know so it just wasn't in the cards for me you know and i was unfortunate that i actually had the numbers and i proved myself but i was just in a situation where a money factor sure. you know somebody ahead of me with more money and all that um well but, it's a thing it's a, we talked about it earlier you just it's something you can't control no well, you know what's interesting if I can add to that though, the the money and I don't know your 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 situation in terms of the contract, the money, the signing bonus that, I was a that senior they were talking sign, about. So yeah, was, eventually, right? But you said where you were drafted at Yeah, I, it was uh eighty. I would have got eighty thousand out of city. You know, and, and it is something that you do have to factor in because if they don't invest a lot in you, you know, money wise, then, then you're not going to get the same opportunity as the guy that got six figures or seven figures. So it is a factor. I, I, my recommendation to every guy that we've had and any guy that I would ever talk to in the future is you just, you know, where are you? What's the best decision? And and there's a lot of factors with that. Are you ready to go out there and make good decisions on the road with, with not a lot of supervision? Are you ready to go out there and, and train and be disciplined and say no to the bars and all that stuff? Because and, and then make a living with your body because your body is your briefcase. That's a saying I stole from uh, Sean Gilbert, who coached with me and is one of my best friends. And he used to say that a lot. You know, your body is your briefcase. And are you ready to go out there and, and earn a living with your body? And some guys aren't quite there yet. And, and I can't speak to your situation. I watched you play when we were starting our call, our, our this program here. I was I was at your Fresno City Games and, and knew I knew we weren't going to get you or anything Mm -hmm. like that but it was it was something to watch and there was that was a good team really good team a lot of good players but um 
I, I, you know, in, in terms of regret, I, I try not to live that way anyways. It, I don't, everything, I believe everything happens for a reason. And, you know, even my journey was a weird one. Um, but I don't have regrets because I became better for every landing spot that I had. Maybe I didn't realize why at the time. And we went, talk to a lot of my players about stuff like that when they go through adversity and adversity off the field too. You, you don't know why it's happening um, most of the time in the moment, but years down the road, there was a reason there, there was some benefit for going through some of that pain. Yeah, no, I agree. And I knocked on the head, the briefcase thing. That's cool. That Gilbert came up with that. That's, it makes sense, you know, especially being at that level. It's not, it's not false because it is hard to say I'm not going out to the bars or to the, you know, the clubs and all that kind of stuff. Cause you don't have anybody telling you not to. Right. Right. You know, right. you're just with the boys having fun. Yeah. yeah. But you dab, get it. You dabbed into, uh, going into, you know, watching this guy play when this program first started. Can you take us to the beginning of FPU baseball and how this all, Got to where it is today. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. You know, it's uh, there's so much to say with that. That's uh, I've been here from the beginning. I started the program. I was the I've been the only head coach, and I'm proud of that. That's that's not something a lot of people can say. Um, and there's been a lot of highs and lows through that through that process. I was. I was at the time of of this job being kind of thrown out there as a possibility. I was coaching at Sanger High School, and I had finished my career, my playing career, and I'd come back home and was kind of working through, you know, coaching. My first job, I was an assistant coach at Reedley College, and then I, I had kind of my main job was at Carruthers Elementary School as a K through eight PE teacher, you know, and then from there I assisted. Uh, Carruthers varsity for one year and then I got the Sanger high job and they were fresh off of a, a four win season or something like that and I wasn't there but I I was uh fixing a lot of things um when I got that job for the next few years and I I coached three seasons there and the fourth season the third season we we won we we got into the playoffs and I think it was the first time in 20 some years they had been in the playoffs and that's what they told me. And, and so the fourth year I was hired at Fresno Pacific and I, I knew at the time it was kind of a perfect storm. Um, I felt like I could do a good job and I was excited to do it for sure. But, um, it was, it, you know, Fresno Pacific, it's a Christian school and, and it was going to go into the NAIA. Now we grew up around here. NAIA baseball did not exist around here. No. So I thought what everybody else had thought, uh, growing up, now I knew different by this time, but growing up, I I, I, I thought that that was a really low level and, and uh, there wasn't a lot of talent and things like that. But by the time I was applying for the job, I knew better uh, for, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, anyways, thankfully, the other candidates around here thought that still. So the fact that it was a Christian school and that it, that, that, there just wasn't a lot of knowledge of what that level looked like. It prevented some of the guys that, uh, that probably would have gotten hired <laughs> over me from applying. And uh, they had made a decision uh, early that they had wanted to go local, which was very wise. And so, so it in, ended up being me, you know, I tricked them. Do you, remember, <laughs> do you remember any applicants off the top of your head? Yeah. Uh, I do. They can be nameless. That's fine. But yeah, just, yeah, I do. You can tell us off the air. I'll tell you off. The okay. Air. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but anyway, so I I so I got the job and and uh, um, so <laughs> that that leads to a whole can of worms. So so I got the job and I did not coach my fourth year of employment at Sanger High. I was I was hired in December, January, December, something like that, on a on a part-time basis to recruit the, for the, the, to make the first team. Right. So we were going from zero, zero players. And, uh, so I was at, I was everywhere. I, I was, I was at so many games. It was just me. I was the only coach and, and I did all the recruiting for the first, what, seven years or so, something like that. When you're a one man show, you, you, you learn, uh, a lot of 
tricks to try to make things efficient. But uh, I knew that I wanted to fill the roster with local players. I mean, that's what I, that was my vision and I knew it was right. And, and I was, that was the right way to go. And so I was at so many local games and, and I was trying to hire staff and my, um, my, my beautiful wife was pregnant and taken us a little bit to get, get that uh, first pregnancy going. And then we found out we were having twins. And, and so that was, it was just, it was just an insane time. <laughs> and, um, we went from, I kept being told, uh, you got to get to 30 guys. You, you have to have 30 guys that, and <laughs> so, so we did it, we made it. Um, but, uh, um, anyway, we, we were told we were going to have a field. And so I was recruiting, you know, saying we were going to have a field cause that's, you know, and you know, that it, it, it didn't happen. Um, that first year. So that first year we were playing at Clovis East. Clovis East was our home home field. And the second year Buchanan was our home field, our, our technical home field. But we played um, home games at 12 different spots. And it was just, it was just a crazy time. So uh, we were talking off air before um, the, the, the first guy I ever signed. So, so I like to tell this story. The first guy I ever signed, I signed him out of Bank of America. Um, not, that's the truth. Mike Pierce. Mike Pierce, the first oh. guy I ever signed. And he was, I had been out of baseball for a year. He was working at Bank of America. And I, I knew Mike, and I knew how good he was, and I knew he was out there. So as soon as I got that job, I called him. And, and he didn't want anything to do with it in the beginning. And about a month or so late, I, you know, I have a way of working on people, I guess. I don't know, but, but I got him to say yes. So he's the first, first Fresno Pacific Sunbird. Um, and first draft pick, right? First draft pick. Yeah. He was, uh, Orioles for, for, yeah. Yeah. Um, for guys, anybody that doesn't know that's listening to this, Mike Pierce, um, hard to find a good, uh, better defensive catcher. Uh, he had one of the best arms I've ever seen in my life. The first time I ever saw him, it was, uh, back then they used to do this fall all-star thing and it would, I don't remember the format and how it was all set up. I just remember I was there and I was coaching and, and, um, they had, a, I think it was kind of more of a County versus a city type thing, but it was in the fall and we had a little bit of a scrimmage before this tournament started and we were playing at Clovis high and, and Mike was co uh, catching for the other side and, and he threw it downhill from home plate. And I hadn't seen that from a high school kid before. Shoot. I don't know how many times I've seen a college guy do that. And, and it was one of those where not just downhill, it looked like it rose as it got about within about 10 or 15 feet of second base. And I don't know, it looked like a, he looked like a pitcher throwing, you know, changing planes, throwing downhill to a hitter, but he was doing it from home plate to second base. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah. First draft pick. First he was pick. at Clovis during their heyday. Yeah, he's. I think he's. He was oh one. He's my age. I think he graduated either oh one or oh two. Something like that. Yeah, because yeah. I was oh three, so he might have been in between us. But yeah, he. I grew up playing against him. He, he was, was good. He was really good. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he had struggled hitting, um, and that's kind of the 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 thing with him. But uh, I remember that first year, um, he he wasn't hitting. But rightfully, you know, he'd been out of the game for a year. And so it takes time. You know, that hitting, hitting is an everyday thing. You take some time off. That's, you've got to make up time. And, and that takes, hey, yeah, you just have to have, have patience. But anyway, we, we, uh, he was not hitting well. Uh, and then about a month or so left in the season, Sean and I, we came home from a road trip. It's two or three in the morning. And, and we're in a parking lot here at Fresno Pacific and just talking about, we got to fix, we got to figure something out. And so we, we, we went back to some very basic stuff. I remember it was a three-step process, step one, step two, step three. And Mike went on a tear and he started, I think he hit six or seven home runs in the last three or four weeks. And he became one of the best hitters in the league for that last month. And it got him, it got him into pro ball. And then he was out there for three years or so. Um, he did a good job out there. Out there and get our W's. 
and within that, you know, you're going through your process. Uh, we've had a few coaches describe, you know, some of the channels they use in backgrounding certain players. And before we started, you kind of made a comment of, uh, you know, I asked you about, you know, they say they go to the high school coach, right? That's their main source for any information regarding a kid in recruiting, right? And, you know, typically they don't go to a travel ball coach, you know, and you've got kids that are paying, you know, annually, you know, thousands of dollars to go travel and play. And, um, well, I think it's not a, a bad thing. You know, I don't mind travel ball, but I just I don't know how too much. much. Yeah, there definitely it's too much. Yeah. And how much development are they really getting? But, you know, your comment was pretty classic. I hadn't heard anybody say it, but, you know, can you talk about who you, you know, prefer to talk to? Yeah, yeah. My my favorite um, way to background, or at least to start, on a, on a on a guy that we're trying to learn about is through players. I, I really a, a player doesn't have um, a stake in it. Meaning, you know, you kind of talk about you know academy guys or travel ball guys or even high school coaches or whatever. Um, they they have an interest in, in in that. But a player, he just wants to play with the best guys that he can, and they don't like to play with jerks. And so if the, the kid that we're asking about the recruit is a jerk, um, they'll, they'll always tell you the truth, man. Kids will tell you the truth. And, and that's how I like to do it. And, um, I don't, I don't, you know, nobody's snitching. It's, it's, it, it's not that it's, it's very easy to go up to somebody. You guys are coaches. So you, you, you get it. Hey, how's, uh, Timmy or Johnny at, such and such he's, school he's a turd they will tell you yeah he's they will tell you they'll say it exactly like that like this guy he can play you know or he he chucks it that slider is unbelievable but man he he's he's an idiot off the field coach i mean you know and you'll you'll get stuff that you would never get otherwise you know um i, I again you know you you learn as you go but um i learned that one early early and then when you think about it it, it it's kind of a kind of a game I, I don't know if it's a game but a way I like to look at things is how did I see it when I was a player and and even though I'm getting old now and and uh and stuff and 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 guys certainly see me as a coach now versus um a guy closer or close in age to them I'm not anymore I can still it wasn't so long ago that I don't remember what it was like to be a player, what it was like to be talked to by a coach, you know, the recruiting process, all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I like to try to remind myself, Hey, how, what would I have would have wanted to hear? What would have meant something to me? What would have been a turn off? You know, what would be terrible to hear and, and all of that stuff. If you can do that, perform that exercise it really kind of keeps you sharp with all that stuff but when I first started at Fresno Pacific because of the because of of the lack of knowledge of what what the NAI was um it was kind of hit or miss how much help I would get from high school coaches some guys were great from the beginning they were just hey it's it's the kid the player and the family's decision um and I just I just love that he might have an opportunity to play beyond high school um, others were the opposite. <laughs> I don't want him to play for some JV high school level thing, you know, whatever this is that you're doing. And, and the guys that, that, that kind of had that attitude, they, they just wouldn't help us. So, so when you're dealing with something like that, you, you've got to find other ways to, to, uh, to get your information, to get the cell phone numbers, to, to, to get in and, and try to talk to the player and, and their family to see if, did the kid feel the same way? Because he might, but then again, he might not. And, and that happened quite a bit, um, especially in the beginning of the program when we had no history with anybody, with anybody, literally, not just locally. So we had to, um, I would have to do that. I would have to try to get a cell phone number and, and talk to the guys and, you know, you get thick skin pretty quick, right? But um, pretty soon, you know, season upon season and we start doing well. And by the second year we were good. I mean, we were a regional team in the third year and we made it to the series in the fourth year and Schwinden gets drafted in the four, uh, third year. He was drafted in the third year. And he ends up making, making it to the big leagues and Mike Pierce, uh, 
that was a big moment for, for him, but it was also a big moment for us when he was drafted in that first year of the program because that got it out there that this was not a place where your pro dream went to die, right? This is a place where it can happen. And so I don't even know how I got to this point. But no, but I, no, that's I, I that's, that is, it's really good because I think kids have that perception and it's completely wrong. It's like D1 or bust. Or I mean, Dara, Jesse was an eighth round draft eighth pick. Rounder, eighth think. rounder, yeah. You know, and he was super talented guy. Yeah, that. Um, so that, that that's actually the guy is, you were talking is, is about. Is that who you were? Well, that's one of them. That's one of them. Um, <laughs> that, that year was 2000, what, 10 or 11, something like that. And we had that, that roster. I was just going over this with somebody. Um, we lost in the Oklahoma City Regional that year. So Jesse was our one. And he was up to 96 um, that year, but he held, held his velo 91, 93 every day, e every day, but one, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, and uh, so he, he was on his way to getting uh, better than an eighth round pick that year for sure. And then uh, Matt Mazzoni, who works for our school now, he was up to 92. He came into the program in 81, 84, but he was six, five, really good athlete out of Memorial. He's um, I think he played shooting guard for the basketball team. He was really good. And he was, he was our two and, um, Aaron Lynn, uh, was, was, was coming back from Tommy John. Um, uh, but if he hadn't had that, no regret, I don't want him to hear this and feel bad, but, um, um, he had, he had blown his elbow out the year before the, when we, we got to the world series without him. And by that time he was 87, 89 with the slider and this fastball that ran the other way. So he was pitching, uh, I mean, he was really good. Um, so he was just working his way back. And then at third base, we had Scott Laird. Short was Merton. Um, second base was Andrew Douglas. Andrew Douglas signed after the draft that year with the White Sox. He ended up that year going out there, playing every third game. He still had 19 bags. He was 19 for 19 in pro ball. That guy was built like a, a fullback. And first base was Wes Durrell. So he had kicked from Cal Poly um a year before that and he had been what second or third team all big west over there center field uh trent sorries who'd kicked from fresno mm -hmm. state no uh he was in right i think uh well, i i'm our my outfield was tyler Pryor, who's one of the best hitters i've ever seen in my life uh trent sorries and i'm now i'm forgetting the the third guy shoot dang it but but I mean, that team was stacked anyways and um our closer was uh, he was 96 more than Jesse Dara was, Michael Rivera. So but he was only a sophomore, so he wasn't draft eligible. He was out of St. Mary's up in, in Stockton. And uh, he signed after the draft the next year. So And then Murdy went a couple of years later. Yeah. And it's, you know, just it's the, the point is, is it, it can happen. You can still come and, and there's good. I mean, it's California. There's no bad baseball around. Right. There. No, um, no. Even in your NAIA days, it was solid baseball yeah and that was that was an NAIA team yeah. um and that's the thing you you learn is is that that I mean that that uh 09 year we we went over to Lewis and Clark and that was a trip the in the NAIA that's that's the the class of the of the of that world and can you talk about though 14 and 15 like I yeah, mean, it was, was amazing. I mean, we were we were transitioning from the NAI to the NC2A, and that's been a really good move for us. Um, you don't have to explain what the NC2A is. Everybody gets it. Everybody knows. So, um, in recruiting, that was that's been fun to to not have to go and explain all that stuff. <laughs> um, because because to be fair, until you see it, it's hard to believe, and then and then you see it. But NC2A, you don't have to to make somebody believe about, you know, that brand. Um, but yeah, yeah. Those teams were special. That first, the first year, the 14 year we had Benuelos, Benuelos had come to us and, um, Michael Tittle, um, gosh, and now I'm going to make these lists and forget somebody, <laughs> but, but, uh, Baron Bauer, yeah. um, Steven Lozier, Michael Hostetler was on, on that club. Um, was um, Preston Scott there then? Preston came the next year. So Preston was in 15 and uh, cause Ben Wellos and Preston weren't on the same team. Cause could you imagine that lineup? I mean, the, the Ben Wellos is one of the best hitters I've seen and he changed. Um, I've asked him about, <laughs> about 
about that, like what changed because uh, he had an interesting story because he had gone from Hanford High to City and then he went to Sonoma and I think they let him go up there and um, and he was out of the game for a while. And then he came back and, and I remember I had seen him and, and I was, you know, I knew he was a good player, you know. And then the first day he was hitting in the cages here, <laughs> I said, oh, Josh, what happened? This is incredible. I mean, he was good, like I said before, but he was special after that and um, his whole year with us. And um, then he was signed, drafted by the Royals, and they gave him a good deal. And so he only spent the one year with us, and then Preston came in the next year after that. But, but, um, and shoot, Benuelos, that first year he hits 300 in pro ball. The next year he hits 354, I think, his second year. So, um, and then Preston gave, came for the two years. But yeah, I digress. Um, in 14, we made it over there. We had JD Sales on the mound, Merlo, uh, Drew Merlo, Wilson Ashford, Ian Raber. And, and that was, that's a D1 pitching staff, or at least they belong <laughs> on a D1 pitching staff. JD was, was up to 92 at that point. And then Drew was upper 80s every day, four pitches. Um, well, those Wilson, guys were aces. At yeah. their, I mean, at Buchanan, he was, yeah. he was a dude. Yeah, yeah. And at Fresno State. And Lozier, too, was, was a starting guy. And, Lozier, yeah. He was, um, Lozier, yeah, he came, yeah. Lozier was really, really good. Um, he was really good. He had gone to Pomona out of Buchanan, out of high school, and then he kicked to us um, right after right after that. But um, Wilson Ashford um, is, is one of the best, if not the best pitcher that's ever come through here, statistically for sure. And, and then Ian Raber, Ian Raber had gone to Northern Colorado out of, out of Hanford West, and then he kicked to us for two years, for his last two years. And that was an interesting one because when, when he got here, I remember uh, Bobby Jake said, this might be the worst set of mechanics I've seen in my life. And I didn't see that first pin, so I didn't see the progress from pin one to pin two because I saw the second one and it was, it was okay. Um, and he goes, you don't understand how, I mean, because Ian was such a hard worker, but by the end, when we got to that season, he was 91 pretty much every day. And it was a heavy 91. It was just on you. And I remember he, he would get, I called pitches and he would get all bitter because he, he'd have a fast curve slider and he probably said he had a change. And I would just call two pitches, which is so rare um, to have a guy that can blow through a lineup three or four times with only two pitches. And, but he could, he could, his, his slider and curve were basically the same pitch i mean or they would vacillate back and forth but the the depth and the sharpness it was it was if he was pumping strikes he was one of those guys that you know you know um those guys that it hits the bat and it just stings it's just it's just a heavy ball and that was ian so that was those were our four starters um pretty interesting and and they were all so different too so how much of that team was on the 15 team i mean um uh ian was back and um wilson jd was gone drew was back um so we did tittle was tittle both years tittle was both years um so you brought some mount you got some innings back that following year too yeah, so oh, i mean yeah. you didn't no, lose we a loaded. whole lot yeah, yeah we were loaded in fact yeah yeah that we were loaded baron bauer was back uh we had preston um, our catching catching situation was Travis Beck, John Kortoff, and Brian Booker. Um, Brian Booker, we had gotten out of Santa Cruz and area code guy. Um, Nick Pate, Nick Pate had uh, was our first baseman. Is he that, Lamore? He was Lamore, yeah. and then Reedley College. Yeah, he was a good player too. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, McKay France was at second for both of those years. Oh, I didn't side guy. McKay. Yeah. yeah. Some yeah. good guys, man. I just forget. You just kind of. Yeah. I'm, I'm playing back all these guys in high school. I remember Lozier hit a ball off yeah. Hayden Hinkle. Uh, he probably wouldn't appreciate me <laughs> <laughs> like me talking about it, but yeah, yeah he had some he, for not yeah. being a really big guy. He could he could oh, he could drive a baseball. Yeah, you know who he reminds me of is Calhoun Cole Calhoun. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, that but is kind of the shorter, stockier guy, yeah. but but can he could really throw too. He could really throw, and just a lot of pop. 
a lot of pop. He he battled his injuries here, but that World Series year, he when we got to the series, um, basically it t- takes you six. We I think it takes you six games to to win it, and so full play and then um, a semifinal and a championship. So we we um, played and and we were able to beat Lee um, from Tennessee both those years, and. Lee, Lee, we had Lee eliminated us in 09 at the NAI World Series. <laughs> same coach, so same coaches. Mark Brew, he does a great job. So, anyways, and then a guy I keep I haven't mentioned before, but Josh Medellis. Josh Medellis got the wins win in both those games. So, left-handed pitcher out of Clovis West. I don't yeah. know if you remember him. Yeah. Yeah, upper 80s guy. Were there any specific guys or like moments, you know, where something kind of just you know how you have just like a, a you know like I'll, or uh, somebody you didn't expect yeah somebody puts the back on their the team on their back and and carries you guys in those years um you know you know one one guy i haven't mentioned i rem- i remember um i think it was the first year 14 uh Tanner Irwin out of uh Hanford West i don't know if you know that name but he was a really really talented kid um um one of our biggest recruits that we'd had up to that point. And he was up to 91, but he was a two-way guy. His dad, um, here's a name your, your dad would remember for sure, but Lou Irwin, um, he, he, anyways, so some old baseball names, but Tanner's dad uh, was Lou anyways. Um, so Tanner came to us and that last month, we, we had to get on a run to, to make it. And I think he, he was pitching out of the pen and I think he had four wins and four saves in the last month. So he <laughs> putting in work. Yeah. He was, he had that kind of arm and his stuff was just nasty. So him and Ian were on the same high school pitching staff. It sounds like that, that hearing those names though, it's some blue collar guys well, in there. Like yeah. you said, it's a, you're trying to get division one. That's a team that you can go play D one baseball players. Yeah. Baseball teams. Yeah, and be successful. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and JD had just come back right from winning a WAC championship too. Right. I mean, he was a D one guy, and yep. I mean, Tittle was a, was a solid player. I mean, that's that's a and they're blue collar dudes. They're not, yeah, you know, they, they like rough around the edges. They were they were field rats almost. Yeah, I mean, you need tough kids to to play this game, and and that that team was both those teams were just filled with tough guys. Doubt. A great Grind, baseball player. Grinded. No yeah. doubt. And then we all know guys that are those showcase guys, right? Right? Yeah. They can go to a showcase and get a scholarship because maybe on that particular day, um, they were dropping bombs or, or whatever. Uh, the problem is, as a coach, though, you've got to live through the player, not just that showcase moment, right? And, and I, I feel for those guys. I, I don't. I, we don't recruit that way. We can't recruit that way. So, so I have the luxury of being able to sit back and, and say that, 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 that stinks, that stinks when you have to recruit that way, because it's such an arms race out there and guys are committing early and things like that. Um, because, because guys are getting snatched up left and right and the, the freshman, sophomore verbaling and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not judging it. It's just, I'm thankful that, you know there there are definite advantages to to being division 1 and 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 um and 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 recruiting that way and then there's there's a couple small advantages for us guys like us that we we don't do the showcase thing uh we can't operate that way because like i said before we we're going to be committed to those guys so we need to know who they are on a day in and day out basis not what they are when they're hot you know yeah or you know, we talked about travel ball earlier. <laughs> you know, how often do you talk to a travel ball coach when recruiting? Never. Never. It's just uh, just throwing your money away. Well, you know, here's the... I, I, I can't totally agree with that because I think it is good to get more reps. I'm not going to knock that. But we that. talked about this with Lappin and, and Underwood. Like, your arm's never fresh. There's you, too you much. I'll off. agree with that for time. sure. I'm just you saying the... The extra games, the playing, I don't have any problem with the kid playing. See, I'd rather put extra work in the cage and ground balls. And I just think playing games, you can't get – you can get better, but you can't get, like, the consistency 
that you need to get to get to that next level. I feel, you know, um, I have a lot of opinions about that. I, you know, I feel, I feel for the kids, these, this day and age, I really feel for them and their families because, um, because of what this has evolved to, right. Um, you, you have so many people in your ear saying you have to do this and you have to do this. Oh, you're taking time off. A player wouldn't take time off. You know, you know, you got to keep grinding and all of that stuff. And, and, and you know what, there are some good guys out there. There are some guys that do some good things for, for, for players. The problem is, is, is I don't know how, if I'm a, if I'm a, and I am a parent and, and my, my, my boys are, are starting to get into this world and it scares me to death. It really does. I I'm fortunate because I know what I know and I do what I do for a living. So I have that knowledge and, and even I can get caught up a little bit with the emotion of, man, you know, should we be doing a little bit more? Uh, I talked to a lot of guys about this and I, and I would say that a lot of them share this opinion. I, I don't, I think youth baseball, the level has never been higher. Okay. And I think the finished product has maybe never been lower you know, when they're, when they're leaving high school. And that has nothing to do with the high school coaches at all. It's not that it's, it's this, this world that exists where you have to go to this tournament or that showcase or, and you're always just playing these showcase style games where winning's cool, but it's really not about that. It's about your exposure and, and, and showing your tools and things like that. And, and I feel for the high school coaches having to live this too, because high school coaches are trying to win college guys are trying to find guys that help uh, help the program win right and sure talent's a part of that but you need guys that know how to play baseball you need guys that understand that a two strike at bat is valuable right and and um while striking out may not be a big deal in a 162 game season in a 50 game season that's a big deal it's a really big deal if you're if you can't make contact um in 50 games and and like we were talking about that short burst 48 hours, four games, if you've got 10 or more strikeouts in each of those games, you're probably not winning a ton of those games unless you play in a Cracker Jack park, right? Where, where you can do that. We don't, we don't play that. So we, we've got to have guys that understand and base running. Oh my gosh, the, the lack of knowledge out there for, for that. And just, just so many of those little things. And, um, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to come off like I'm holier than thou and blasting everybody for not knowing baseball as well as I do or something. That's, I hope, I hope that doesn't sound that way. It's just, I wish times were a little bit different where practice was valued as much as the games. You know? Well, I think that's yeah. what you don't get with travel ball. I don't know how often they practice, but. But you're again, also not going to have, <clears throat> you're paying me to, you play on my team. Uh-huh. Am I really going to tell you? That you're not good. Right. Because if I say that, you're going to take your money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So how truthful are these kids being coached or being taught things? That's the big picture. So you're you're having a kid out there that if you're on a travel team and you want to go to a showcase, well, then you better be the one, two, or third best player on your high school team. If you're not even that, then you're just wasting your money going to these places, you know, Cause when it comes down to it, you're going to talk to players, you're going to talk to coaches, you know, and if, Oh, this guy was at a showcase. How is he on your high school team? Well, he doesn't even play. Right. Well, I want to get him back to talk to, to a travel ball coach. That guy hasn't had that kid since he was 15. No, you know, right. you, you've had him for four years. You know, there's no, I don't need to talk to a guy that you see every other weekend. Right. For two games. You know, it's a tough deal. I, I know um, you get into some areas outside of, the central Valley and, and high schools aren't allowed to, to be with guys, um, out of the season, right. I think in the, in the South, uh, in a lot of those sections down there, um, some of those academies and things like that have, have, have been born out of necessity because the high schools can't put in, um, they can't coach their guys out of season or something like that. And I, I know aren't those, nor, aren't those coached by the high school? Co- don't the high school coaches put together teams? I don't know how all that stuff works. I, fortunately, I don't have to live yeah. in it. It's just, um, I don't want to, I don't want to not preface some of the, my opinions without acknowledging that in some places it might be a little bit different and, yeah. and maybe some of those travel guys or Academy guys, um, do have guys for a long period of time and do, um, do have, 
maybe uh, history with them and, and are teaching. But this is where I get back to the value of high school baseball, though, and college baseball. And, and, and I kind of long for the, the ways that it used to be. Um, the, the game is hitting and pitching, but there's so much more to it beside, uh, along with it. And I guess my advice would be to players is, is that, you know, if, if you're a really good hitter, it still doesn't make you a great player yet. You know, there's still so many other factors and, and, you know, I like to tell our players this, and we want you to be a good, a great player, not just a great hitter or not just a great pitcher. You need to be a good player. And that's everything. That's offense. That's defense. That's a, you know, if you're a hit a position player, that's the short game. Um, that's uh, understanding situations and being able to hit behind runners, understanding RBI situations and, and being able to knock guys in. Uh, it's kind of funny. I've heard today's day and age, I've heard this comment that RBIs don't matter. And I just, not in my world, they don't matter. I, they matter. That's last time I looked, it's, it takes runs to, to win your baseball game. So I need guys that can knock guys in and that's a skill it, that's your swing matters. It certainly does, but can you get your swing to play? Now that's, that's the other thing. It's, we've got to have it all. And then base running, like I mentioned earlier, we, we you know, we, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just some of the mistakes that you see out there. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of funny. So my, um, if, if we could get back to those days where we have teachers that are coaching, not, not, not just, uh, not just talkers. Some, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, to save say that for, nice. I'll say it for you. <laughs> stories and and uh you know you you hear a lot of people saying the same things and it's like i think i think we're talking to the right people and i think we're getting the right information to the kids that that and i mean parents. that's ultimately what is yeah. for you know it, it, there is some entertainment in hearing your story and how this program developed but also you know they're listening to a guy they could potentially play for yeah and yeah. i think that's important for yeah. parents and kids to hear whether it be you know coach batesel uh coach yeah. purse you know, when you hear this next level thinking, it's like, man, it, it's not, it's different, you know, and yeah. it gives them an opportunity. To, there's a decision to make. Yeah. Where do yeah. I fit? You know, that, that is the biggest thing. And that's obviously our angle. Um, when we talk to guys is, 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 is finding your fit and, and, um, you know, I bounced around and so I feel like I can really speak to this cause that wasn't great. That was not a good experience to bounce around. Uh, now I'm thankful for every, every bounce that, that, that occurred because I, I developed more relationships and, and learned other coaching styles and, um, other journeys and, and, and all of that stuff. And I'm able to use all of that to, to kind of factor in to, 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 to me in this program and, and the like, but, um, you know, ev everybody, I think when they, when they, um, when they start playing baseball, they dream of being a big leaguer. And then if not, then D1. And I, and I can understand that dream. Um, what we always talk about is, is, um, that, that, that may be so, but, but all, but we have a lot of great things to, to offer and here's what they are, you know, and we may, we may be exactly what you were looking for after you really consider everything that we're saying, or we may not be, and that's fine. That is fine. Um, and the worst thing, and I say this to almost every guy, the worst thing in the world is, would be for me to talk you into this, trick you in. And six weeks into this thing, you say, I hate this place. I got to get out of here. Cause that doesn't help them. It doesn't help yeah, us. It doesn't benefit anybody. Right. But, but vice versa, you know, I mean, um, if they, if they go someplace else and then they bounce to us, that's great. And, and we'll take them, but may, maybe we could have chose better the first time. You know, maybe we should have factored in some other things. And, and when I say those things, I mean it because I lived it, right? My, my parents weren't athletes. And so me and my twin brother, when we were growing up, we were, we were kind of charting new territory for our family. That's what I'm talking about. So we didn't have a lot of people to bounce this stuff around with and, and help us to, to make a good decision. So we kind of fell into everything that we did. And, and that's why I say the, the, 
this hit or die podcast is so great because it's, it's helping people to get some information and a lot of information and, and a lot of thoughts and a lot of things to consider because most of the time when, when a guy's first starting this recruiting process, what are they thinking? Where, how, how cool is it if it's Malibu and I'm hitting three hole and <laughs> yeah, right. And, and D1 walk off and, into the sunset, yeah. you know, a Friday night and coach is going to be, um, he's going to tell me how much he loves me every day and <laughs> things like that. And, and, and we all know that's not how right. it really goes down, um, in most places. Right. And so, uh, when that, that bubbles burst a little bit and, and you kind of wake up from that fog and you're having to live whatever it is that you've chosen, um, um, it, it, it's sobering, right? It, yeah. It's sobering. So maybe we can help. And that's how I recruit. Maybe I can help get guys to think about everything. And then you make your decision, you know, then right. you make your decision. So you, you, you put yourself out there. It's very much like being an athlete, right? Um, not everybody can do this. Not everybody can be a college athlete, whether it's baseball or, or another sport, but yeah. our world is baseball. You know, people get to watch our worst moments. They, in fact, they're paying for it. You know, right? They, they pay admission and they come in and they're eating their popcorn or whatever. And they get to watch, you know, our, all of us that have played, you know, have some really, really bad moments. And that's part of the risk that we take. And, um, but it's also part of the joy, right? And and when it goes right, it's beautiful. When when it doesn't, it's it's a, it's a learning moment. It's, it's not, a lonely it's island not, out there. <laughs> yeah, but it's nothing to regret, man. It's, For sure, this is this is what makes it fun. Anyway, so uh, as it relates to you guys, if you put yourself out there, and then this is a good thing. People are listening. Well, we appreciate it, and for all the listeners that are out there, we appreciate you guys. And yeah, it, the the feedback for the most part's been extremely positive. It's you know. And I'm sure the people that are being negative are just just to having fun. So, yeah, but some uh, of them, some yeah, of them are haters. Yeah, it's all good. It's kind of like calling pitches, right? <laughs> you know, everybody no, knows what to throw. Yeah, but nobody, the coach doesn't have hindsight, right? <laughs> he he only has the information he has, right? Yeah. So, no, it's been fun so far, and uh, like I said, we'll keep going with it. And coach, again, just thank you for sitting with us. It's been a it's been a treat, and uh, yeah, good, good luck to you. Yeah, this good year. luck going forward, and. Uh, just everybody, thanks for listening to the show and uh, hit or die. Hit or die. Hit or die.